Good afternoon. Welcome to our panel on Montessori and the independent mind. I'm Allison Kunze. Ayn Rand, champion of the independent mind, championed Montessori education for young children. In 1970, in her newsletter, The Objectivist, Ayn Rand featured a three-part article by Beatrice Hessen titled The Montessori Method. Following that, Ayn Rand wrote her own unforgettable four-part article for The Objectivist titled The Compra Chicos, in which she praised Montessori early education in contrast to traditional education and primarily in contrast to progressive education, which ran focused on and lambasted in her essay. The Montessori method rests on a foundation of respect for reality, respect for the child's ability to reason, and respect for each child's individuality. It's no wonder that Rand approved of it. Further, the method is all about allowing and encouraging each child's independence. Fundamentally, allowing growing children to be independent in thought and action in an environment that's appropriate to their stage of development is what the Montessori method delivers. So that's what we'll be discussing today. Each of us will focus on the particular stage of development where we have the most experience and training. Catherine Dickerson and I will divide the early childhood stage, birth through age six, with Catherine focusing on birth to three, infants and toddlers, while I focus on ages three to six, the Montessori, what we call the Montessori primary environment. And Bussy will cover the childhood stage of development, ages six to 12, focusing on lower elementary and upper elementary. And Matt Bateman will take the adolescent stage, ages 12 to 18, the middle and high school Montessori environments. We'll be using pictures here and there and would like to take a minute to thank the following groups for their kind permission to use their photos. Higher Ground Education, Chesapeake Montessori School, Laporte Montessori School, The Biederman Family, Narden Academy, and Atlas Academy. Thank you. In the Objectivist Ethics, Ayn Rand describes the virtue of independence as, quote, one's acceptance of the responsibility of forming one's own judgments and of living by the work of one's own mind, unquote. Her character, Howard Rourke from The Fountainhead, is the paragon of independence. What was necessary for Rourke or for any human being to develop and achieve independence? According to both Rand and Montessori, it all starts at birth. Catherine? Thank you, Allison. You're right. Life begins at birth. And for human beings, life requires independent thinking. So my theme today is this. Every child from birth needs to, wants to, loves to, and can do his own thinking. Let's start at the beginning. I invite you to imagine a newborn baby just expelled from the warm, soothing fluid of her mother's womb into the cooler air, taking her first breaths while facing a wild onslaught of sensory stimuli, an undifferentiated cacophony of loud sound sights and manhandling. Then she hears the familiar cadence, rhythm, and inflections of her mother's voice, not muffled as she's been hearing it for the last two months, but clear and bright. She turns her head toward this familiar sound, that irresistible invitation, and makes her first integration of sight and sound. She turned her head. She made that integration. She has begun to use her wonderfully active mind. Ayn Rand describes the first years of life in her essay, The Compra Chicos. If in any two years of adult life, men could learn as much as an infant learns in his first two years, they would have the capacity of genius to focus his eyes, to perceive the things around him by integrating his sensations into percepts, to coordinate his muscles for the task of crawling, then standing upright, then walking, and ultimately to grasp the process of concept formation and learn to speak these are some of an infant's tasks and achievements whose magnitude is not equaled by most men in the rest of their lives. Dr. Montessori, in her brilliantly insightful observations, saw in individual infants and young children not empty vessels waiting to be filled, not blank slates waiting to be written on, not lumps of clay waiting to be molded, but incredibly active minds. The greatness of the human personality begins at birth, she wrote. And she saw these new beings born with a psychology of world conquest, 
that is, eager to master themselves in their world, who, quote, seek for independence by means of work, an independence of body and mind. Little he cares about the knowledge of others. He wants to acquire a knowledge of his own, to have experience of the world and to perceive it by his own unaided efforts. Sounds like first-handed independence, doesn't it? And productivity from birth. Ladies and gentlemen, these women are writing about the children in your lives. Dr. Montessori referred to infants and young children's unaided efforts, but we know that children require our care and protection. Physical care is only one piece of our aid to our children, again in Dr. Montessori's words. No one can do for the child the work he has to do to build the man he is making. No one, in short, can do his growing for him. I will add, no one can do his thinking for him. Dr. Montessori again, our work as adults does not consist in teaching, but in helping the infant mind in its work of development. Every child from birth needs to, wants to, loves to, and can do his own thinking. Now, the effort and concentration Dr. Montessori and Miss Rand observed come naturally to babies and young children. They're exploring and experimenting every waking minute. That's how they accomplish all they do in their first two years of life. And though it's not conscious, infants from birth are in focused attention, initiating choices, pushing themselves to master challenges, and delighting in their achievements. Dr. Montessori tells us that our work as adults is not teaching, but only, quote, helping the infant mind in its work of the development. To this end, I'm going to offer you one basic Montessori principle, plus a principle I've learned working with children and families, along with some practical ideas for implementing them. You also have resources on your handout. Here are the two principles. One, involve your child in everything you do with them, and don't do anything for them or to them that they can do for themselves. Two, give your children information instead of directions. These two principles combined give children opportunities and time throughout every day to experiment, explore, and practice with real life materials, the skills that they need for living, guided by their own interests and at their own pace. Giving them information instead of directions allows them to do their own thinking and to make their own decisions rather than just passively obeying us. So what does this look like in real life? We adults are busy and always in a hurry to get a gazillion important things done. In that spirit, we rush maybe while talking on the phone to diaper, dress, and feed our infants and young children, carrying them in our arms or backpacks, packing them into a stroller or car seat, all the while expecting their passive acceptance of our care as we do things to them and for them. But infants and young children have a completely different focus. From birth, they have an intense drive to master themselves in their world, and they are deeply involved in learning the process of the activities that are required for living, activities that we automatized ages ago. They want to practice one step at a time, over and over and over again. They need to, want to, love to, and can do their own thinking. Allison talks about her infant grandson turning a light switch on, and off, and on, and off, again, and again, and again, and again, with concentration and delight. Here's another example. It's getting chilly, and I want to put a jacket on my little Sarah, who is busy on the floor exploring. She's concentrating, and I don't like to interrupt her, but I don't want her to catch cold. I wait for a pause in her exploration. Oh, you're really having fun with this softball. It's so fuzzy. I hold the ball steady until she lets go. I'm going to put it right here because it's chilly and I'm afraid you're going to get cold. So I want to put a jacket on you. I'm going to pick you up. One, two, three, up. There we go. And now I'm going to sit you in my lap and we're going to put on this jacket. Okay, I've got a sleeve ready for an arm. She waves around. Got it. Push, push, push. Oh, there are those fingers. 
Okay, that's one. Now across your shoulders and your back. And I've got another sleeve ready for an arm. Got it. Okay, push, push, push. There are those fingers. Okay, we've got this on. And now I'm going to zip you up. Are you ready? One, two, three, zip. <laughs> Does that tickle you? Okay, I'm going to put this little hood on. There you go. And now you're all cozy. Oopsie. Now you're all cozy. Would you like to go check out that ball again? Yeah? Okay, here we go. Up and down. I'm going to put your ball right here so you can grab it. In those few moments, you saw me combine verbal and nonverbal language, which gave little Sarah the experience of real meaning to my words. I'm going to lift you up now. You saw me slowing down to her pace, allowing her time to take in, process, and respond to the information, and allowing me time to observe her responses. And you saw my acknowledgement of her response, which gives this little one the experience that her thoughts and feelings matter. You also saw me wait until she paused in her exploration. From Dr. Montessori, concentration is the key that opens up the, to the child the latent treasures within him. When a child is concentrating, she's working. At this age, she's beginning the construction of her character and her intelligence. And at these times, Dr. Montessori exhorts us to discreetly and silently observe, not interrupting and distracting with well-meaning directions encouragement, or praise. Now for toddlers with their lively mobility, ever more intense need to master themselves and their world, their hunger for challenge, and their intense drive to be agents of action. We see this everywhere. The toddler who walks on the brick edging instead of the sidewalk, challenging his balance, reaches to grab things from the grocery shelf, wants to touch and carry everything, runs and climbs at every opportunity, melts down in a tantrum when told no. So let's slow down and involve them in their daily life, the work of their daily lives. Let's go at their pace, introducing concepts firmly grounded in reality via simple language describing their experiences, giving them time to process each step, ourselves time to accept and respond to their responses, which gives them the experience that their thoughts, interests, and emotions are important. Let's give them information instead of directions, the time to process and respond to it all, and come to their own conclusions. When you give young children this level of respect, you'll find you have a lot more cooperation and far fewer tantrums. Because every child needs to, wants to, loves to, and can do his own thinking. It's when we do the thinking for a child and don't give him the time and opportunity to do his own that most behavior problems arise. So much for the terrible twos. Now let's take a closer look at the wonderful twos. You'll see them in Montessori toddler environments around the world. My classroom was on display through a huge picture window next to the entrance of the school. Parents would stop and watch in amazement as these tiny children prepared food, dressed themselves, watered plants, set the table for lunch, sat quietly together on a sofa looking at books, swept the floor, and much more, while I sat at a chair observing it all. Of course, I gave lessons, but I made sure to make time to observe throughout every day. That's how I knew who might be ready for what. Outdoors, these children watered the vegetable gardens, sometimes pulled out a plant to check, does this one have roots too? Explored the properties of water by pouring it into different surface, onto different surfaces and into different containers, and climbing, climbing, climbing. How do you make them all do this, was a frequent question. Now, anyone who spent time with a two-year-old knows that making 12 toddlers all do this isn't possible. But with free access to activities that interest them, tools that fit them, slow, careful lessons in how to use those tools, and my vigilant respect for their concentration, each child learned to freely choose to take on whatever task interested him and to work on it for as long as he wanted. Then each child put his materials back where he found them, ready for the next child. Most of the children mastered almost all of the activities because every child from birth needs to, wants to, loves to, and can do his own thinking. There were also many other activities in the classroom, lots of language, art, 
music, dancing, but practical life is the core of a toddler's life. You can do this at home too. Check out the resources on your handout. Now I'm going to briefly demonstrate these principles of involving a young child in everything you do with her and giving information instead of directions applied to a common problem, leaving a fun activity to go home. Tantrum territory. A young neighbor of mine enjoys coming into our backyard to experiment and explore. For a while, she repeatedly filled a watering can and poured the water onto various surfaces. Her mom kept directing her to pour the water on the plants, but I encouraged mom to just quietly observe her daughter's physics experiments. So fascinating to watch the young mind at work. But after a while, mom had to return home for a Zoom meeting. She told her daughter they had to leave. This determined little girl ignored her and kept pouring. Mom approached her and her daughter yelled, no! Mom looked at me. I said to Lisa, that water is spreading all over the wood. Lisa poured it onto the bark mulch and it soaks into the mulch. You really like pouring with that watering can. Lisa smiled up at me. It's fun, I said. <sighs> and now your mom needs to go home for a meeting. Lisa scowled. You want to stay and pour some more and your mom needs to go home to work. You can come over again. The watering can will be ready for you. I reach out my hand for her to take and hold. We can put it back on the shelf so you'll know right where it is. As I involved this little girl in the process of a big transition, notice the focus on what was important to her, not just what I needed her to do. Notice that I gave her information instead of directions and the time to think it through. Notice my acceptance of her protest with another acknowledgement of her value. Finally, I involved her in the process of leaving as we walked together to put the watering can in a safe place. I did not take her hand, I offered her mine. Notice the level of cooperation. To sum up, young children want to be explorers and experimenters, thinkers and doers, not passive watchers and receivers. They wanna be agents of action, not just entertained. They want their thoughts and feelings to be accepted and respected, which is not the same as agreement. Thomas Gordon once famously said that children don't rebel against their parents. They rebel against their parents' attempts to control them. That means against their parents' attempts to do their thinking for them. In the Compra Chicos, Ms. Rand wrote that young children implicitly ask two questions. Where am I and is it worth it? This process of slowing yourself down to your child's pace, involving him in everything you do with him, acknowledging his thoughts and feelings, giving him information instead of directions, allows infants and young children to be free to do their own thinking and develop for themselves these answers to Ms. Grant's questions. Where am I? I can figure it out. Is it worth it? It sure is. I'll add, am I worth it? You bet I am. And now these little thinkers and doers, these eager agents of actions are ready to move up to Mrs. Kunze's class. Allison? Allison? The second half of the early childhood period at about three years of age. This stage goes from roughly age three to age six. By this time, they've acquired some mental tools, perception, the ability to direct movement somewhat, early concept formation, and now they're eager to use these tools. Developmentally, they're beginning to consciously self-manage more and more of their thinking and actions. In the same way that the Montessori toddler environment that Catherine talked about is carefully prepared to foster independence, so too is the primary or three to six classroom. First, there's the setup of the classroom itself. In every Montessori class, there are shelves containing a number of activities. Notice in these pictures, you see shelves with a lot of different materials. One material of each type in wooden containers and baskets. Materials are grouped on the shelves according to subject area. I won't be explaining what the various subject areas are today, but in every Montessori three to six class, you're gonna find materials for practical life, what we call sensorial, also language, math, science, geography, as well as art materials. And we can use the next slide. So how do the children know what to do with the materials so that they can work on them independently? Throughout the morning, the teacher, sometimes called the guide, 
will give lessons to individual children or groups of two or three, meaning the teacher is going to take the activity from the shelf to a table or a rug on the floor, depending on what kind of activity it is, and demonstrate how to use the activity or what we call the work and how to put it away. For example, here, the teacher is showing this boy how to use a pencil. It may be a little hard to see, but he's going to use the pencil in order to trace a metal shape on a piece of paper. And after getting a lesson, this boy can take this activity to his table from the shelf and perform the exercise at any time, today, tomorrow, two months from now. He can use it for however long he's purposefully engaged in it. I mean, if he's knocking it, if he's knocking the uh, inset on the floor, the teacher will intervene. But otherwise, there's no time limit. If another child wishes to trace that particular uh, shape, he will have to wait until it's been returned to its place on the shelf. So many choices are possible in a typical morning for each child because there's a long, unbroken three-hour work time and children can work independently with whatever they've had a lesson on and they build up a big storehouse of lessons very quickly. At this age, the activities are very hands-on. The child is using mind and hand together with purpose. Let's take a look at a few examples here. Now, in these pictures, I want you to notice the children's faces. Here from the sensorial area, this boy is matching plane shapes from the geometric cabinet to the pictures. This girl is doing multiplication problems and recording her answers using what we call the multiplication beadboard from the math area. Here, the child is building words with the movable alphabet and matching the words to the cards which have pictures. And here, two children are using the decimal material from the math shelf. In each case, notice the look of concentration on the children's faces. Montessori identified an important principle that Catherine has already mentioned. It applies at three to six two. Concentration on freely chosen work is the key. Montessori observed over and over in her work with children that when they freely choose some purposeful hands-on activity that captivates their full attention as they work to completion, that they emerge from that type of experience in a very satisfied state and seek out other activities that lead to a similar outcome. They're gaining knowledge and the key is that they're the driver of their own learning and mental growth. They're developing their mental faculties through the work that they do. Because concentration is the key to their development, there's another aspect of the Montessori environment that's important. The Montessori teacher does not interfere while they are engaged by interrupting, helping, correcting, or even commenting on what the child is doing. Instead, the teacher's job is to observe is the child stymied and directly looking for some help, in which case the guide would probably step in, or is she figuring things out on her own? Is she using the material incorrectly and may need a representation at another time? Is she speeding through the work as if it's not even a challenge at all, or maybe she's just using it to be sort of restful? Through this type of careful observation, the teacher's thinking about where the child is in terms of her knowledge, skills, and abilities, and also mentally noting what the child needs next, which activities in the classroom will hook her interest and keep her moving forward independently. Not only does the teacher refrain from interrupting the working child, but the children also learn that same respect for each other's work. They learn not to interrupt, and not to enjoin each other unless invited. Of course, they're gonna be silently observing each other, especially the younger children. They love to watch what the older children are doing. To reiterate, concentration on a freely chosen piece of work is the key. Dr. Montessori put it this way in a lesser known writing that she addressed to parents. Quote, a child does not know why he is interested in a particular object or movement at a particular moment. The important thing is that he is interested in, is he is interested. 
Therefore, what interests him at the moment is appropriate to his need, unquote. So we promised to give you some tips. Parents and grandparents aid with children ages three to six, what does this mean for you? Well, a couple of things. Of course, you're gonna be looking for the hands-on activities that captivate your child's interest to offer them as a choice and also let them take care of their needs at home. Things like getting their own food and dressing themselves, for example, or at least they can help with food prep. But also my point really is once little Jesse is absorbed in an activity, act as if you are not there. In other words, don't break in on that period of concentration by commenting or trying to get him to extend the activity. Well, what if you just do? Or by correcting his movements right then or by exclaiming about how well he's doing. As Catherine recommended with the younger children, observe unobtrusively and allow that concentration on that activity to come to its natural conclusion. The independence I've been talking about involves the child's own choice of activity and their own independence in working with it without outside interruption. And that amounts to their own independence of thought. They're learning to direct their minds and bodies to take care of their own needs and to carry out their own chosen explorations and purposes. They're also learning about what they value in the world, what calls out to them and lights them up. And this excitement about their own interests and values, which is just starting, really builds and flowers at the elementary level. In my remaining few minutes, I wanna focus on the objectivist view of independence and how it relates to Montessori education. Dr. Peacock, in his chapter on virtue and OPAR, titled his subheading on independence this way, quote, independence as a primary orientation to reality, not to other men, unquote. In the three to six classroom, and indeed at every level of Montessori education, the child's primary orientation is toward reality. They learn about the real world through exploration. They have real purposes, sweeping a floor or preparing food. They use real objects like knives or glassware for pouring. And things are called by their real names. For example, this geometric solid is a rectangular prism. So more parent takeaways here, allow your children to use real objects and have real purposes as much as possible. For example, a four or five-year-old can actually use a hammer and nails if they're given a lesson. And call objects by their proper names right from the start. For example, this bird is a cardinal. But there's another sense in which children learn, as Dr. Peepkoff says, a primary orientation to reality, not to other men in the Montessori classroom. And it has to do with psychoepistemology. Ayn Rand's essay, The Comprachicos, is instructive here. She wrote, quote, the first five or six years of a child's life are crucial to his cognitive development. They determine not the content of his mind, but its method of functioning, its psychoepistemology, unquote. And further on, quote, the programming of a man's subconscious consists of the kind of cognitive habits he acquires. Those habits constitute his psychoepistemology. It is a child's early experiences, observations, and subverbal conclusions that determine this programming, unquote. In other words, the first five or six years are crucial in setting the mental habits that the child automatizes, the mental connections that become automatic, and the way his mind habitually deals with its content. So what mental habits are children forming and automatizing in the Montessori environment? Days spent there give children experience after experience of learning about reality firsthand, of making their own observations, comparisons, judgments of forming concepts, consulting their own minds and independently making their own connections and choices and of automatizing that way of functioning mentally as opposed to the habit of looking to others, either teachers or peers or uh, parents to tell them what to do every minute or what to think. 
Implicitly, the Montessori method promotes a primacy of existence orientation rather than a primacy of consciousness one. It lays the basis for the child to become the type of independent individual for whom Dr. Peikoff writes in his chapter on independence, quote, the primary in his consciousness, that which comes first in any issue, is not other men, but reality as perceived by his mind, unquote. That's the fundamental connection between the Montessori method and the independent mind. It makes perfect sense that Ayn Rand championed early Montessori education. Now I'll turn it over to Anne, who will show how the child continues to be the driver of his own learning and development at the elementary level. Thank you, Catherine and Allison. I'd like to begin with more thoughts on independence by both Ayn Rand and Maria Montessori, because I think the quotes fit together so well. In The Fountainhead, Ayn Rand wrote, nothing is given to man on earth, Everything he needs has to be produced. And here, man faces his basic alternative. He can survive in only one of two ways, by the independent work of his own mind, or as a parasite fed by the minds of others. Maria Montessori said, the child who has never learned to work by himself, to set goals for his own acts, or to be the master of his own force of will, is recognizable in the adult who lets others guide his will and feels a constant need for approval of others, end quote. In order to develop independence, a child needs knowledge of reality and also self-discipline. All the activities for children in a Montessori school have these goals in mind. The elementary program for children 6 to 12 builds upon the foundation laid in the toddler and primary classes. I worked with children in the elementary classes in what Montessori called the second plane of development for most of my career. In fact, the main reason I founded Chesapeake Montessori School was that I wanted to work with children in this stage, especially the 9 to 11-year-olds, in a school where the administration would be to my liking. I love working with children this age because they're super capable and eager while still being fairly innocent. Dr. Montessori found that children 6 to 12 have their own special sensitivities for learning. These children need a different kind of prepared environment than children 3 to 6, and they need different types of lessons. They need to explore reasons and causes use their powers of abstraction to learn about things which they cannot perceive directly, to work with other children on projects which can sometimes involve what's called big work, and to work in an environment wider than the classroom, such as the outdoors or libraries or museums, etc. The Montessori Elementary Program offers a high degree of individualized instruction and work. Introductory lessons called keys are given to start the children working in a particular subject area. They present the essentials of each subject in a way that will stimulate the child's desire to learn. The lessons use concrete or illustrative aids at first. Then a child is shown how to work in the abstract. Many unique Montessori materials and activities are used to help the child make this transition. For example, a key lesson in history for older elementary children might involve the display of a large timeline showing the development of early humans for the last 500,000 years. The timeline depicts advancements such as the discovery of various kinds of tools and eventually of farming and the building of settlements. It also shows the ice ages and time periods when the earth was much warmer than it is today. <clears throat> Follow-up lessons involve text cards and pictures for a particular period. Children can read and sort the cards according to which aspect the material on the card deals with, the climate encountered, tools, food, etc. Eventually, working independently or in small groups, Children can do their own reading and writing about a period in the development of humans. There are no textbooks or workbooks like those found in a typical classroom. 
Instead, a child may choose from a variety of books on each subject based on goals and interests. The children use their reading and writing skills as they undertake research and reporting about chosen topics. In the process, each child uses and develops a precious possession, his reasoning mind. In a Montessori elementary class, a child is given lessons in many areas not necessarily included in a standard school curriculum, and exploration and research can take the child into much greater depth than is achieved in a standard classroom. Each child is helped to integrate various aspects of the curriculum so that he can better see relationships between physical, biological, and cultural phenomena. For example, in exploring the evolution of life on Earth, children can study plants, animals, geological history, etc. This slide shows the timeline of life, which is nine feet long and depicts the development of plants and animals over the last 500 million years. Some of the big work that these children produce seems amazing to many adults. For example, some children take on projects such as writing long fictional stories with many, many chapters. And I've seen many small groups of children undertake huge written problems in long division, with dividends in the millions or billions and five or six digit divisors. In order to accomplish this, the children would tape together many pieces of graph paper and work on steps in the solution over many days, often taking turns in the process. They simply taped on more graph paper when they ran out of room. This shows the materials the children first use for solving problems in long division. The dividend beads from the test tubes are counted out in colored cups. The divisor is shown by placing tokens at the top of the divisor boards. Then they divide out the beads and can see the answer on the boards. They also write the problem as they work. Eventually, the children don't need to work with the beads at all, happily for them, I might add, because they've automatized the concept firmly rooted in reality. The abstract division work is a good example of the theme running through the work in the elementary class, moving from the concrete to the abstract. Everything is presented first by means of concretes, through timelines, real plants, pictures, manipulative math materials, and concrete grammar materials, etc. Children happily progress to working abstractly in various types of work. The elementary child's capacity for abstraction allows his imagination to explore everything from the origin of the earth to the reaches of outer space. Montessori said that the essence of independence is to be able to do something for oneself. And as I said earlier, gaining knowledge of reality is one of the main components. Allowing children to explore their interests and learn about them helps the children gain confidence and efficacy. So does all the work that helps them master academic skills by moving from the concrete to the abstract. Going hand in hand with the development of a child's reasoning mind through exposure to a rich array of materials and lessons, the other necessary component of independence is self-discipline. The children are doing this all the time as they work. Montessori, Montessori found that they're making and carrying out choices that help them learn and develop. She found that children will control, a child will control himself out of choice when he's given an adequate scope of satisfying activity. Furthermore, in a Montessori elementary class, each child is given many responsibilities for attending lessons, sometimes from a daily posted schedule of lessons, for choosing and practicing work, for choosing a place in the classroom to work, for using materials correctly, for straightening the materials on the classroom shelves, for cleaning up after lunch, and for keeping a record of his work and follow-up practice. Sometimes parents want to know how they can aid the development of these eager young minds. 
I think it's important for parents to help these children at home pursue their investigations into what interests them. Sometimes the investigations are short-lived, and sometimes they last a long time. My seven-and-a-half-year-old grandson just began his second year in a Montessori elementary class. He had an interest in ancient Egypt, but that didn't last very long. But his passion is animals. He reads and studies an adult animal encyclopedia. His mother takes him to their neighborhood library often, and they take out many books on animals. I took him there recently, and he checked out 14. Sometimes it's helpful to hear the thoughts of young adults who themselves attended a Montessori school. I saved some of the talks that alumni in my school gave when I invited them to speak at the graduation ceremony we held at the end of each school year. Here's what one of our alumni had to say in a talk given in 2004 when she was about 18 and had graduated from the upper elementary class years before. Quote, learning not by simply memorizing facts, but by visualizing and understanding the concepts behind the information is key to retaining and expanding one's knowledge. Through numerous activities, such as the sandpaper letters, the pink tower, diagramming, and the checkerboard, children learn actively. I enjoyed every single day at CMS, well, almost every day, maybe because it was never boring. I could complete work on something I was interested in and then create a project to expand on the subject. These ongoing projects not only allowed us to create and learn even more, but also to manage time, work with others, and develop our independence. This yearning for exploration goes hand in hand with another trait CMS has instilled in so many children, motivation. Having such an independence and sense of self always drove me to want more. CMS taught me to do my best, and because students aren't rewarded or punished with clear-cut grades, they define what is acceptable by how well they know they've worked, not by a number scale. Self-motivation is a trait that will take someone very far, and CMS students are lucky to learn this early in their lives. Close quote. And now you will hear from Matt about the next stage of development, adolescence. Hi, can you hear me? Um, do you guys actually have the handout that we keep referencing? No, that's too bad. It's, um... I think it's on the app. Oh, it's on the app. OK, then you should look up on the yeah, app. It's I, know got it's, some, I know it's uh, there. It's got some great resources. And, banger quotes, so check it out. Um, so adolescence is the phase of development that um, is most naturally thought of by most people as a phase of development. Everybody remembers their own adolescence as a different time, a tumultuous time. It's a distinct phase. There are obvious physical changes that are happening. Um, there are pretty obvious psychological changes that are happening. Um, it's also the time that um, the stage of development that Maria Montessori wrote the least about. Um, so, um, uh, she wrote the least about both the kind of developmental nature of the phase, like what's going on in the phase, and also much, much less about what should education look like at this phase. You've just seen a really beautiful set of presentations that included specific materials and specific classroom practices and specific scheduling structures and specific teacher training on how to, how to deploy all of that. Uh, Montessori never really worked that out, so there's no for example, adolescent curriculum or set of materials in Montessori. Um, but, but she did say some really, really important and interesting things about adolescence. What she said really guides our programs at Higher Ground Education. Um, we have seven or eight adolescent programs across the country, middle and high schools. We have one in Austin um, that it's worth kind of looking into and checking out if you're local or if you have the time. Um, and, um, and so it's easy to both undervalue, uh, it's easy to undervalue what Maria Montessori said about adolescence. So what did she say? What did she say about adolescence? So if the first stage of development, this zero to three, three to six, this zero to six period is about mastery of your own mind and body, um, this kind of basic independence um, that, um, that Catherine and Allison described, and then the next phase of development that Anne just described, the elementary years, it's about mastering your reasoning mind. That's what that phase is about. It's, a, it's the age of reason. So you go from this absorbent period 
where you're really working on your basic character, um, to this age of reasoning, this age of thought, this age of explanation. That's what the elementary period is about, this burgeoning intelligence. You need to independently understand everything about the world. What is adolescence about developmentally? And I'll just let that question hang for a second um, while you think about what, what, is, what is this phase about? Um, for Montessori, the term that she uses to describe this phase is that the adolescent is a social newborn. A social newborn. And I, I actually don't think that this phrase is super precise, but it's, it's still powerful and it's worth unpacking. So first, the newborn element. Um, teenagers are insecure. I probably have teenagers in the audience, so it, it always makes adolescents super comfortable when you like talk about them and describe them um, scientifically. So, um, um, but t teenagers are insecure. Um, I was certainly insecure as a teenager, and and it doesn't necessarily have to be like a deep neurotic insecurity. By insecure, I don't necessarily mean anything kind of that cutting or defective or profound, but. Um, um, it's a characteristic of the age. It's not just hormones or girls or um, it's it's that you're really pushing you're pushing the boundaries into um, into adulthood. You're starting to become independent with respect to everything. So you're starting to. You're not yet independent when you're a 13 year old with respect to everything. But you, you know your parents really play a much more delimited role at this point in terms of their custodianship over you. Um, an elementary child, a younger child, it's the parents who are keeping the long term in mind. It's the parents who are like, try, and, the, and the adults and the, and the teachers who are like, keeping in mind, like, it's important to study certain things for certain reasons over the long term, or it's important to keep up your nutrition in a certain way over the long term. You start to have to do that your own when you're, when you're a teenager. Um, not just culturally, this is just, this is just what happens. You're growing up, you're becoming your own person. Um, and even if you're generally confident, and have a great Montessori foundation, um, um, you've never done it. And it's, it's a scary thing, and you don't even necessarily know what questions to ask. What is the next 60 or 70 years of your life that you're about to start to become rapidly, increasingly responsible for? What are they about? What do you do? What's the meaning of it all? Um, how do you interface with it? And how do you even, how do you even start? Um, so that's, that's the newborn element. Montessori thought that adolescents were, for this reason, um, more similar to toddlers and infants, kind of dis dispositionally, um, that, that this is a tumultuous phase, not to elementary children, which is a much more stable phase. Um, so what's the answer to that question? How do you resolve insecurity? So you have a teenager who's insecure about something small, like the fact that she has to go and live her whole life. <laughs> How do you resolve that? Um, well, the way that you resolve insecurity is through earned confidence. Earned confidence. Um, you have to actually, there's no substitute for it. You have to actually start to do it and start to get good at it. And this is where the social half of the social newborn comes in. So don't be triggered by the term social. Don't think social metaphysics or socialization. Um, instead, think something more like um, civilization or the fact that we exist in an economy. Um, and, and a really wonderful, complex economy. And that the answer to insecurity and that the answer to what life is about, even though we don't necessarily tell, um, tell teenagers this in Montessori education, we're not like, the meaning of life is X, Y, and Z. What is the actual answer as to what the meaning of life is? Um, what does Rorick say it is to wine end? Yeah, it's work. It's work. It's your work and what you make of it. You make something of your life. You shape the world that you live in. Um, and you find meaning in that, you find power in that, it helps you. Um, it's part of this project of civilization to, to, to rend the world um, fit for human beings and better for human beings, and it also means something to you. That's in fact what teenagers are about to embark on even if they don't fully recognize it. And that's the thing that they need practice with, that they need help with, that they need support with. And so the emphasis, the, the independence that teenagers need, this kind of social newborn independence, is um, it, it is economic. Um, not in the sense of economic independence, like go out and get a job and get an apartment and you're on your own now, um, but in the sense of preparing your character and preparing your mind and practicing to, like, yeah, like you're going to engage in an economic system in a civilization that is quite advanced where you're going to have to make money and convince people of things and work with others. And, um, and that's a value that should be seen as a value. That's something to be valorized and loved and treasured, not something to be scared of and nervous about. 
So um, so to get practice with this, because everything in Montessori, as all the other speakers have, have correctly emphasized, is about independence, you have to, you have to kind of do it yourself. And so what Montessori th said about this age in terms of the programming is um, when you enter middle school, you should leave your home, move into the country, and live on a farm. You guys are laughing. Um, it's not a joke. Um, that, that's, that, that's what she said. And, and, and so she thought she, she had this concept called the Erdkinder. The far, uh, it's also called a farm school or the land school or the farm model of school. I mean, the idea is um, to take the idea seriously, and I think it's worth taking seriously. It's you go to a place where a significant portion of your time is spent on productive activity, in this case, the productive activity of agriculture. So, so don't think the farm school is in like hobbyist, hippy-dippy gardening. Think like driving a tractor with a tiller attached to it and like measuring the chemical, um, the, the fertility of the soil and organizing labor around it. And you're doing that, it's not even, it's not like a full-time job. This isn't like back-breaking labor, like we're doing, this Montessori is not a kind of like covert way to get child labor back, back into the school system. But it is like, it's something that you take seriously and that you participate in. The pricing of the, of the goods at produce, like you're, you're helping to run an enterprise and this enterprise is set up and scaffolded so that it doesn't take up all of your time and that you're learning certain things from it and the characterological element of it. Like what kind of person works and enjoys working is really emphasized. Um, there's, that, that's not all you do. So there's also academics and lecturers and, and other things that come in. I'm not gonna talk as much about those just due to time constraints. The thing to emphasize at this age is teenagers should be working. And they should be working um, with an eye towards not getting a job or meeting, 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 up, meeting up to the needs of the modern economy. So those things are good. And, and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't um, um, uh, poo-poo those things, um, but, um, but, but working to get a sense of what work is and to fall in love with work and to fall in love with work in a modern context. Montessori thought that this was really important for teenagers. So I have a quote here um, that you can find on the handout too. I'm just gonna read through it briefly. I love this quote. This is from, um, from Childhood to Adolescence. Um, the inert child who never worked with his hands, who never had the feeling of being useful and capable of effort, who never found by experience that to live means living socially, um, and that to think and create means to make use of a harmony of souls. This type of child will become a selfish youth. Don't be triggered by that term, selfish. He will be pessimistic and melancholy and will seek on the surface of vanity the compensation for a lost paradise. And thus, a lesson man, he will appear at the gates of the university and to ask for what? To ask for a profession that will render him capable of making his home in a society in which he is a stranger and which is indifferent to him. He will enter into society in order to take part in the functioning of a civilization for which he lacks all feeling. So if you think about Rand and objectivism and her view of man, um, the point, I mean, she, Rand really emphasizes reason, but she emphasizes reason as something, as man's means of survival, right? Um, and um, um, the, the vision of life is not that she offers is not a thinker in the sense that most people hold the term thinkers. In a sense, it is a thinker. But it's, if you had to summarize it in, in two words, would, you want to be an impassioned valuer. You want to be an impassioned valuer. And this is, this is d a dimension of um, Rand's ethics that I think is very relevant for education. Um, I think it's often underexplored and under, under exploited by, by objectivists, um, that this is what we're shooting for. It's not just that we're creating good thinkers and independent thinkers, so that's a key, key part of it. Um, it's that we're creating valuers and independent valuers and that work in adolescence in particular is a central component of that. Um, it's, it's a central com having a central purpose is a central component of being, a, of being an impassioned valuer. Um, um, this, is, this is something that Montessori is really, really good on. It's what draws me to Montessori more than anything is how good she is on work. Um, all the other speakers have emphasized that, that children, even infants, do a kind of work that's work in a sense that's developmentally appropriate and meaningful for them. Um, Montessori thinks this has, this has continuity with adult productive work, even though that there are differences. And adolescence is a great way to kind of understand this and to see this. Um, so um, just briefly, most Montessori adolescent programs are not farm schools. None of the ones that we run are. Um, um, if, you kind of, if you abstract away from the farm itself and think 
Students should be engaged in economic activity. There are a variety of different forms that that could take. Um, you could, you could um, and, and we live in a time where there are a lot of different opportunities for teenagers, from individual opportunities for internships and jobs to different kinds of group economic um, projects that, that you can engage in at the school to, to other things as well. And this is, this is really what we've done in our programming. Um, um, so, um, let me just glance at my notes. I'm not texting, I just have a few notes here. Um, um, yeah, I think, why don't we end there? We've got four whole minutes um, for, qu for questions, so we've kind of gone on a little bit. But um, yeah, I mean, I, in general, I, I just want to plug, um, take my uh, um, speaker's privilege. I know that Ocon is a no solicitation zone, but um, with myself or with Rager and our CEO at Higher Ground Education, we are a solicitation zone. Um, so, um, so feel free to come up to us and talk to us about our work and our projects. If you're interested in Montessori education, we're doing a lot in terms of opening schools and other kinds of practical things that you might be interested in. So um, thanks, everyone. And I'm going to sit down. Who, who's moderating this? Should I just? I don't care. Just OK. <laughs> All right. um, Thank you guys for this. It's been really wonderful to hear your different perspectives on all the different ages. Um, what I'm curious about, because I have read Leonard Peikoff's Teaching Johnny to Think and heard some Q&A answers from Ayn Rand, where they have, criticism isn't the right word, but maybe some uncertainty or skepticism for the relevance of Montessori for the older years. And I'm wondering if you guys have ever encountered anything in the Montessori philosophy or the curriculum that you find counter to objectivism or not commensurate with objectivism. Do you want well, to I'll, I'll say, by the way, I think, I think Catherine and Allison can answer questions too, depending on, I guess, for whatever, whichever one of us seems more logical. But anyway, but I'll start with that. Um, Maria Montessori was also religious, but, 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 she, she was, I guess she, you could say she was like Aquinas because she compartmentalized it. So you know, really her method is very reality oriented in terms of what you're doing in a school. So, so I don't really, I personally don't find anything about the method itself that contradicts objectivism. No. What about you, Matt? Um. Yeah, I do think that there are things about the method that contradict objectivism. So, um, I mean, some, it's what some of what you just alluded to. Um, she is very Catholic and um, theosophical in terms of, and this this gets into the curriculum. Um, this this particularly gets into the curriculum in the older years. The way that the um, everything becomes a kind of story and a myth um, in a way that has benefits. It has real advantages, and I don't think it's like a fundamental corrupter of the child's mind. But there are opportunity costs to kind of how it's structured and set up. Um, I don't think that, I, I mean, I think that the idea that um, education is for this individual child and that it's really about helping this individual child live life, Montessori believes that and she sees no contradiction, rightly sees no contradiction, contradiction between that and kind of like fixing the world and helping society, but it's, um, it's much less clear um, kind of, um, I, mean, I mean, the language in Montessori is, is very much like, we want to get education right so that we can fix the world and, and kind of have, have a peaceful world. And that, that orients her towards work and towards the purpose of the child in a certain way as they get older that makes it sound a little bit more like you're discovering a path in civilization rather than forging your own path. And um, it's, it, it's subtle issues, but they're important issues. And I think about these things a lot, so. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question relates to the period between three and uh, six years or like one to five years um, mastery of mind and body, but it's a little tangential, so bear with me. Um, I breed birds and I have to hand feed them and be with them for, you know, for as long as they're still young and dependent on me. And I've noticed, for example, that if they get themselves in difficult situations like now they're on, they flew and now they're on the curtain and now they're sideways and they don't know how to get down without hurting themselves. If I jump in and save them, that gives them less confidence going forward. Um, but if I let them solve their own issue, then um, they become more confident and more prepared, I guess, for life ahead. So if you don't mind, can you kind of, have you seen any similarities between how 
children learn this kind of thing in the beginning and animals learn um, mastery of their own mind and body to their limited <coughs> capability? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think, you know, animals are driven by instincts mostly, but I do think you're right. If you uh, let a child struggle to do it themselves, they gain much more confidence and physically, children will pretty much do what they're able to do safely. So if you have a toddler who is at the playground or, or a three to six year old who is at the playground and they're just not ready to go down the curly Q slide, I mean, you can, you can encourage them, but you may want to go with what they think their body can do. And often if you see a younger child scaling a, uh, a ladder, they're pretty much able to know what their bodies can do. So uh, it, it's, worth, it's worth being a spotter, but, but also I'll say don't put them on an equipment and expect them to do something. Kind of see what they're able to do. And when a child is in a difficult spot, unless it's an immediate danger, if instead of swooping in to rescue them, you slow them down and help them figure out one step at a time how to get out of that problem, and then you've, you've given them the help that they need, but you haven't done it for them. So slowing things down and saying, hmm, looks like your foot's stuck here, and, and describing what you see one step at a time, then they can figure out how to get out of it. And unless it's, of course, an emergency. Yeah, I mean, hu humans are mammals. Um, and mammals learn by practice. And, um, and the, the, the thing that's new for humans, even for human infants before they're even kind of conceptually thinking, is that um, the psychological elements of that, the confidence, the self-esteem, the, like, the question of can I do it, that becomes of paramount importance. Like, it, like it's not about can I put this jacket on myself. Um, it's about are you the kind of person who can do things yourself, and and so so that that really takes it on. A, I mean, this is this is really what determines the emphasis in the Montessori curriculum is that kind of deep psychological, characterological independence, and that that's the difference with other animals. But it, I mean, there are there are definitely parallels. Thank you. We have time for one more question, and this one comes from online. <laughs> so Naveen asks. If Montessori is mostly directed based on students' interests, how do you ensure that they acquire all the necessary skills? I didn't understand that. that the, the, will you re please, please repeat the question? Yes. If Montessori is mostly directed based on students' interests, how do you ensure that they acquire all the necessary skills? Good question. Um, the answer is that you, they're in a prepared environment. It, it, it's structured and you, you're, as a teacher, you're responsible for giving them lessons and everything that they need. Then they can, they can practice some things more than other things as long as the other things get practiced sufficiently. So th their, their choice they're given as much choice as they can handle, but they're not free to not practice things that they need to know. Does that yeah. answer? I think so, yeah. I mean, Montessori, is, it's a pedagogy of inspiration. So, so it's not just that whatever you're interested in, you get to do, and whatever you connect with yeah, in the Montessori classroom, like, you're, you're like, the, the teacher is like constantly trying to figure out, like, how do I inspire and get the child yeah. to fall in love with, um, that they're like coaches, they're, they're inspirational speakers, they're, they're, they're developmentalists and experts at motivating children to do things. So you can't, you don't force a child to do things, but, but it is like, Montessori is opinionated that like, math is important. Foundations of culture and science and history are important. Literacy is important. It's not just the child feels like doing it. it, it the, the teacher gets in there and inspires the child to do it if, if it doesn't happen naturally, and then the child chooses it on that basis. There's no short circuiting that process. You have to, the child has to choose it, but um, there are ways to get somebody to choose something. Hum human beings aren't, um, aren't unconvincible. Even children aren't unconvincible. And I'll give an example here of a little boy who came into my classroom and was very excited about the ants that had made a trail through the room. And he was just consumed with ants. And by learning about all the different kinds of ants and all the places in the world they live and all the things they eat, 
He learned geography and math. He learned to read. He, he covered the whole classroom based on ants. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of creative things. Once you know a child's interests, um, a, a clever teacher can do a lot. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.